Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our service here this morning at Brunsfield Evangelical Church. My name's Alistair. If you don't know me, I'm one of the elders here, and it's my pleasure just to welcome you this morning. Particularly if you're visiting with us this morning, can I just extend a really warm welcome to you, and I just pray that our time together this morning is blessed as we just gather together to worship. This morning, we're going to continue um, in our series through the book of Malachi. Um, one of our elders, Ian, will come and speak to us later in the service. We're going to sing, we're going to pray, Pete's going to do his kids talk, and then later on in the service we're going to hear from Danny, although not in person because that would be difficult because she's in Thailand. Uh, we're going to hear from Danny remotely uh, through video. Um, uh, one of our ex-trainees, she's just going to give us a bit of a missionary update about what she's doing and her plans for the future. So let me pray to open our service and then I'll hand over to Fiona and the band who are going to lead us in worship. Father, we just thank you that we can gather here together in your name. Would you just help us to come from the different weeks that we've had? Would you help just to prepare our hearts for what we are going to sing in worship, for what we are going to hear from your word, that it would resonate with us, Lord, that it would uh, give us food for thought as we just seek to deepen our relationship with you as we continue on, Lord. We just thank you for this time together this morning and ask that you would just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, morning. So we worship a God who has forgiven all our sins and has lifted us out of the miry pit. So let's begin our song worship by giving back to him the first few verses of Psalm 103. Let's stand together and recite this back to our God and then we'll sing some songs. So let's stand. Let's worship with all our hearts and all our souls together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's sing together. Two, three, four.
that we may not enjoy, but we know that you do it for our good. And we just return back to you the words of Paul, your servant to the Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Okay, good morning. For anyone who doesn't know, my name's Peter, and I, I work here uh, with the kids. Uh, and I want to speak particularly to the kids. What I'm going to do, we're going to do a recap um, of what the kids were learning, particularly the, the primary school kids, really, what they were learning at Kids Church last week. We're going to do a recap of that. So kids, if you maybe want to come over here, uh, there's some free seats here for you. Okay, because I want you to look at something. I want you to look at it something and see if you can spot the difference, okay? Right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to do a recap for the kids. Uh, it also helps everyone here know what the kids are up to in Kids Church, what they're learning. And it's also a good prep for this week because uh, what they're learning this week really follows on from last week. And I know some of the kids weren't here last week because of holidays and things like that. Okay, are you ready to play Spot the Difference? Okay, are you ready to play Spot the Difference? Okay, so what you have to do is you have to look at me. You have to look at me and see if you can spot a difference. What is different about me today? Okay, we've got lots of hands up here. Have you spotted a difference about me? Is there anything different? One side of your leg has a chain, the other one doesn't. Okay, well that is true. So that's a difference between left and right, but I normally wear that. That's quite, I quite often wear that, that's for my wallet. I normally wear that, so it's not that. Have another look. Oh, I know Have another look. No, she knows what it is, but she's not going to say. Glasses. My glasses. I've not got my glasses on. Okay. Okay, now that not, might not look like a big difference for you guys. Okay. But for me, it makes, it does make quite a difference. Everyone's all in focus. Now, I can see. I can, I can see okay, but everything's like a little bit blurry. And then when I got my glasses on, because, and these are new glasses. I got new glasses just about a month ago. Everything is really sharp and in focus, and I can see really well with my glasses. So I need help to see. I need help to see. I need my glasses to help me to see exactly what you look like. Okay? And that's like our story last week. Last week, Jesus helped a man to see. It was a miracle. And it's one of the probably the most unusual miracles in the Bible. One of the most unusual miracles in the Bible. Can anyone remember what was so strange about this miracle? So this man, he was blind, and then Jesus helped him to see. But there was something really strange about it. Let's go down and ask what was strange about this miracle? Jesus had to do it twice. Jesus had to do it twice, okay? Now, it wasn't once for one eye and once for the other eye. It was twice altogether. He had to he put his hands on the man's eyes, and the man could see, but what he saw was a bit odd. What he saw was a bit odd. What could he see? Shout it out. Walking trees, he saw people, and when he looked at the people, they looked like trees walking around. So that was really strange. So what did Jesus have to do? Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes again, and this time he could see properly. That's really strange, isn't it? That's really strange. I mean, what do we think about Jesus? Was Jesus having a bad day? Was he having a bad day? Was he, had he not done it right the first time? What was going on? What was going on? They were trying to teach them, so when you're blind, you don't know anything about him and you don't believe him. And then middle, like, you know about him, but you don't really trust him. And then fully is when you fully trust him and you know him. Exactly. Well done. That was a really good... You have remembered really well. A round of applause there. <laughs> so right after this miracle comes that question, that question that was in our memory verse, where Jesus says, 
Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And what did Peter answer? What did Peter answer? What did he answer? You are the Messiah. You're the Messiah. You're the Messiah. You see, other people, Jesus, before that question, Jesus asked other people, who do other people say I am? Can you remember who other people said Jesus was? Can you remember? Who did other people say Jesus was? What were some of the options? Elijah. Elijah. Maybe Jesus, guy, Jesus, maybe he's Elijah come back. John the Baptist. Maybe he's John the Baptist come back from the dead. A prophet. Or maybe he's one of the other prophets. So people were saying all these things about Jesus. They could see he was good, that he was a good guy, he was from God, but they didn't know exactly who he was. But Peter knew he was the Messiah. And it's like the guy who was blind. When he was blind, he couldn't see anything, okay? And some people, they just can't see who Jesus is at all. They don't know who he is. And then when the guy could kind of see, that's like who people, when people can see that Jesus is good, that there's something good about Jesus, but they don't know exactly who he is. They don't fully understand and trust and know him as the Messiah, as their savior. But this week, we are going to see that Peter, although he knew Jesus was the Messiah, he didn't quite understand what that meant, okay? And we're, today we're going to find out exactly what it meant that Jesus was the Messiah, okay? So after, or during the next song, rather, during the next song, uh, all the littlest ones can head out to crash room three with Alex and Graham. The field, uh, the likes of this little guy, will head out to the field, uh, room two with Corey and Stuart or Amy. Kids church then, that's with me upstairs, where we're learning about uh, Jesus being the Messiah and what that really means. So you're upstairs with me and Alta. And in the embassy, all the secondary age kids, you're going to head out to room uh, one. You're going to be with uh, Stuart Reed and Kirsty, uh, And you're going to be studying the passage that everyone else is going to be learning from uh, the sermon today. Okay, so let me pray. And then we will wait for the next song. Okay, let's pray. P R A. Why? Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the boys and girls here. Lord, we thank you for bringing them here. Lord, we thank you for uh, the parents bringing them. We thank you for all the leaders in all the different groups. We thank you for them. Pray that you'd bless them, bless their time with the children. And Lord, uh, we pray particularly for uh, the kids' church kids as we think about Jesus being the Messiah. Help us to really understand what that means. But pray you'll be with all the groups and help them. Pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work. And I pray for each one of us here, Lord. Pray that we would truly know Jesus as the Messiah, Lord, that we would see clearly. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and show us exactly who Jesus is and what that means for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just run through some of the notices uh, this morning uh, before we uh, speak. We've got our Monday prayer um, evening on Zoom at 8 o'clock, uh, as usual, this week. So great if you could come to that. We've also got our evening, uh, evening equip service at 6.30 uh, tonight in the upstairs hall. Uh, we'll be continuing our series in Philippians there, and Aaron's being interviewed uh, tonight by Graham. So it'd be great just to come along to that. Um, Church lunch next Sunday. I think I um, mentioned it last week in the notices, so just another uh, plug for the church lunch next week. Just be great, particularly if you haven't been to a church lunch before. Great to come along. It's a great opportunity to spend time together as a church family with food. Um, but we do need a number of volunteers to help that run smoothly. So that's just provision of puddings, which is always uh, nice, but also just help in setting up, uh, clearing up, uh, and just generally helping with the church lunch. So if you could do that, the link in the newsletter is there, or you can contact Jill as well. Um, there is also a women's Bible study uh, this Wednesday at seven o'clock, and Simona is going to be speaking uh, in verses in Mark 5. And there is also the ladies' brunch on Saturday the 4th of March. So great if you could have that in your diary as well. That's half 10 till 12. So please let Kate know if you'd like to come to that. I'd like you want me to add anything into that? No? Good. Um, okay. Um, can I also just, um, in the weekly newsletter, if I could just highlight the Easter events that are plugged in the newsletter, um, just save the dates um, really for you. And just a request for volunteers for the event on Saturday. So if you could have a look at those events, 
see what you're free for. It'd be great if you could sign up to help with those. Just a little bit of advance warning. And then finally, uh, on the same day as the ladies' brunch, we're also having a work party in the church as well, which is our second one. Um, the first one was really productive. Our basement has never looked so tidy. I know that's not a visible thing, but to someone like me, having a nice tidy basement is really important. So uh, that, that's really, that was really good. Um, so we're having a next, another work party on the 4th of March from 9.30. Um, not necessarily just DIY, but lots of cleaning and tidying uh, just to be so that the church is looking spick and span in advance of all our Easter events. So that's the notices. Um, we're going to sing. During the songs, the kids can leave for their activities. And then I'll just come back up and just speak a little bit about the video from Danny that we're going we're gonna to watch. Yeah, let's stand together and sing two more songs. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart.
Now, normally as a, a, a regular thing in our morning services, we have like a mission slot where we'll hear from one of our missionary partners and get an update on what they've been doing. And so um, this month, we're going to hear from Danny. Um, Danny was one of our ministry trainees here. I'm sure known to most of you that were here. She was here for two years and left. And uh, her longer term plan, which I'm sure she'll explain in the video, was is to go to Bible College in Singapore for a year. Uh, she has a real heart for sharing the gospel uh, out in the Far East. So we're going to hear from her just now. Um, she's been in Thailand teaching, so that's where the video comes from. Um, so we're just going to play this video. Um, after the video, um, John's going to come and pray, lead us in prayer. Um, Derek will come and do the reading, and then Ian will come and speak to us from our verses in Malachi. Hello, I hope you're doing well. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Danny, and I was a ministry trainee at Brentsfield um, up until last summer. Um, so just a little update of what has happened since then. Um, I guess, so I'm just passionate about um, reaching people groups who would normally not have a chance to hear the gospel ever. Um, and just, yeah being a light for Jesus in places where there aren't many lights, if that makes sense. So this year, I'm hoping to continue like theological training um, in a more relevant cultural setting. Uh, so I'm sorting paperwork, I'm saving, um, I'm making plans to study hopefully in Singapore. Um, so in the meantime, while all this gets sorted out, <laughs> I am working on my CV, just making myself more employable for countries that might not that might not appreciate um, just church experience. <laughs> um, so that is why this video is coming to you from Chaiapum province in Thailand. Um, I'm teaching English here um, at a high school just for a semester or a term. Um, and I, it's just been a great experience, actually. I really love being here. Um, I get to spend time with a lot of very sweet students, um, helping with English, but also just chatting about uh, big questions. A lot of them are very open when they're speaking their second language. So I get a lot of kids asking me like, oh, I have a crush, what should I do? But also <laughs> things like, why are we here? Like, wh what is life about? Um, why, <laughs> you know, why do I exist? What's my purpose? Um, and it's just been amazing to be able to like connect with them and have some of these uh, really deep conversations actually. Um, what has been a really big uh, culture shock or like adjustment about living here is just uh, the lack of Christians. Um, there's about 10 believers, I think, in, in my whole city. Um, and most of us are foreign, we're not Thai. Um, so it's really challenging, um, it's challenging to live in a place that just has no concept of who God is, but it's also like a big challenge to know that a lot of the kids and teachers and, uh, street vendors I meet, like I might be the only Christian they ever know. <laughs> um, so I've done a lot of thinking about, okay, how do I teach English? How do I do my paperwork? How do I, uh spend time with people or treat my naughty students in a way that glorifies God. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, um, but it's been really good to sort of think through those like practical things. Um, and it's also just been like an exercise in really committing time to being in Christian community um, and just really appreciating those <laughs> 10 Christians. <laughs> Um, and just recognizing that we just really need each other and trying to be an encouragement and receive encouragement from them. Uh, it's been really good. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has been praying for me. I really appreciate it. Um, pl uh, please continue to pray. <laughs> um, please pray for my relationships with the students and the people I meet for more opportunities to have these really cool conversations um and for for the church pray for just spiritual growth um for all the people that are attending and just for again more opportunities to be able to share um it would be amazing for there to be more than 10 christians in chaiapum uh one day 
Um, please pray for my future plans. Um, just boring things like paperwork needs to come through um, in time. Just pray for things to get sorted um, so that I can start studying in September. And I guess please pray for me as I prepare to leave Thailand. My last day of teaching is going to be the 3rd of March um, and then I'll be coming back to the UK for a bit. So yeah, I need to say a lot of hard goodbyes and I want to try and leave well, but I'm also really excited to come back and I will see you all in like a month or two. So I'm really excited to, to be back at Brunsfield again um and to hear how you are all doing so thank you again for praying um thank you for keeping in touch and see you soon well, good morning everyone and at this point in the service let's uh, spend some time in prayer together and we're praying especially for danny today um, and uh, very grateful for the little uh, video uh, that update that she's given. And we'll pray too for Stuart and Rebecca, who just left for Thailand, I believe, and they're starting their training for missionary service in Japan. Um, let's play, pray also for the needs of the fellowship, uh, for those who are unwell, and we'll pray for the services and the activities of the week, and let's remember each other in prayer. I'll just read a few verses from Psalm 86. Uh, these verses in themselves are a prayer. Psalm 86 and verse 3. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and loving, Abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you again for this time in the service when we can join together in prayer. And dear Lord, we thank you for the hymns that we've been singing today and for the praise and worship songs, uh, the verses from your word that remind us of your goodness and how you're the one who's ready to forgive and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we know these things to be true and we know that you do hear our prayers. And just as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 86, you do listen to our plea for grace. And our Father, as we come to you in prayer this morning, we find that we are in need of grace. And so we rejoice that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That real and well-timed help that we need. Thank you, Lord, that you hear and answer our prayers. And in this confidence, we come to you in prayer today. Uh, we can agree with the psalmist when he said, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Our Father, during this past week, we have sinned in thought and in words and in deed. And there have been times when we've known exactly what is the right thing to do, say or think, but rather than do these things, we've done the opposite and we have sinned against you. Lord, you've been so good to us. How could we disobey you and how could we grieve the Holy Spirit? Forgive us, our Father, we pray, and help us to lay hold on your promise that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And lead us on, we pray, to a closer walk with you. And as a fellowship, may we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And may we be filled with the Holy Spirit. And may the fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in our lives that love and joy and peace 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And help us to serve you, dear Lord, as we ought uh, here at church week by week, uh, in our homes, in our places of work, in our daily lives. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. And may we keep our focus, our Father, on the Lord Jesus. Keep us near the cross and always remembering all that Christ has done for us. His body broken and his blood shed for us. How Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose triumphant from the grave on the third day. And how he has risen, ascended to heaven, and one day will return in glory. Our Father, we are praying especially for Danny today, and thank you for her time of service here at Bruntsfield as a ministry trainee. We thank you for all that she has done for you here, and for the blessing that she has been to us as a church. And now, Lord, as Danny goes on to Bible college and further Christian service, we pray that you will bless her and that her time at college will be a good time and a time of equipping for the work that you would have for her to do. We pray also for her safety and protection. And we pray too for, for Danny's students as she witnesses to the students in her class. We pray for the church, for those 10 believers. Uh, we ask that you will build them up in their faith in you. We pray too for uh, all of the paperwork and the things that need to be sorted out as Danny uh, makes plans for the future and pray that you will bless her in all of these things. And Lord, we want to pray also for Stuart and Rebecca as they set off for Thailand this week and bless them in their plans to serve you in Japan. And we're reminded of the Great Commission and how uh, we are to go and make disciples of all nations and surely we all have a part to play in this, both here and uh, further afield. And well, there's still time. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless the work of world mission. We pray for the advance of the gospel and the growth and building up of the church. And that those who have never heard the good news about Jesus and his love will have the opportunity to hear it and will respond in repentance and faith and put their trust in Christ. Our Father, we are so privileged to be able to come to church every week and to hear your word preached. Uh, we have our Bibles and uh, there are so many uh, yet in the world today who have never heard the gospel and they have no hope and they're going to a lost eternity. As things stand at the moment, forgive us, Lord, for our lack of concern and stir us up to pray and to go wherever you would have us to go. Dear Lord, we'd also bring to you the fellowship needs at this time and thank you for the good news that Lynn's treatment has gone well this week. We pray you'll continue uh, to give her healing and help in every way. And bless Fraser, Ross, Jack and all of the family as they continue to care for Lynn. We pray to our Father for all the church and for all those who are unwell. Pray for those who are struggling and those who are going through difficult times. Uh, help us, Lord, to be those who look out for the interests of each other. Uh, just as your word says, uh, we don't want to be those who look out only for our own interests or what we can get for ourselves. Help us rather to be willing to serve, uh, even in some small way, in the church and to do as much good as we can for others and help us to pray for each other uh, often and to build one another up and never to tear one another down. Forgive us when we have uh, looked too much to our own interests and have forgotten about others. And we ask Lord now as we continue in this service of worship that you will bless Ian as he preaches your word to us and we pray that you will bless Jonathan's preaching this evening also. Bless Peter and the team as they speak to the children. And give us ears to hear what you're teaching us from your word. Help us to get to know you in a much deeper way, Lord, through the sermons that we hear here at church, uh, through our daily Bible readings. And help us to really get into the Bible so that we'll know what it says, even from cover to cover. 
And so we'll be able to understand it and to know uh, your word, the whole counsel of God. Uh, Surely, Lord, your word is so plain and clear about the way to be saved that even a little child can understand it. And we know that everything in the Bible is for our instruction and help. Uh, Help us to uh, read your word and really understand it. Uh, Help us, Lord, day by day to be led and guided uh, by a right understanding of what your word says. And rather than looking elsewhere for answers, help us to pray and to look for the answers in your word first and always. Help us always to do this, Lord, and help us to go on uh, to maturity, just as your word says, uh, not needing the milk of the word, but rather solid food. Uh, May we become skilled in the word of righteousness and by reason of use be able to distinguish good from evil. And so, our Father, we thank you for this time of prayer and ask that you will hear our prayers and bless this service of worship and forgive us our sins in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning, Uh, my name is Derek McLeod and we're continuing our series in Malachi in verses 6 through 12 of chapter 3 and that starts on page 961 of the Pew Bibles. Um, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, And the vines in your fields will not drop the fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you you blessed, for yours will be delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. And I'll pray for Ian before he comes up. Uh, Father God, we give thanks that we are able to meet here today in your word. Um, We pray for Ian for guidance and wisdom as he preaches on the passage we just read in Malachi. We give thanks for the work that he has done to prepare a sermon. I also pray that you'll open um, our ears and soften our hearts as we hear from Ian as he preaches your word now. Amen. Thanks very much, Derek. Good morning, everyone. I'll repeat the welcome as I'll give you. Really good to have you with us, whether in person or electronically. It will help if you keep your Bibles open so you can refer to the passage as we go along. I want to start this morning with an only connect type question. So I'm going to show four pictures on the screen and you have to think, what is it that links them? Now, you've not got buzzers, I'm not expecting you to shout out, but if you get it after two or three, you can give yourself a pat on the back. So here are the four pictures. First one is a rainbow. The second one is a sandy beach and a starry sky. I'm sure a lot of people are getting there pretty quickly. The third one is a wooden box uh, covered and decorated in gold. And then the fourth picture is a glass of wine. I think some puzzle faces, some people have clearly got it. They're all signs of covenants in the Bible. The rainbow was the sign of the covenant that God made with Noah, that he would never destroy the earth again with a flood. The stars and the sand are are the covenant God made with Abraham uh, when God said that his descendants would be as many as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. The the wooden box is the Ark of the Covenant. It represents the covenant God made with Noah uh, and with the Israelites. And in the Ark of the Covenant, among other things, were the tablets with the commandments on them. And then the glass of wine is a symbol of the covenant that Jesus made with us, the new covenant. It is part of what we call communion. And Jesus said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant 
in my blood. Four Bible covenants, there are more, um, but four key ones that are represented by these symbols. A covenant is simply an agreement or a mutual commitment. Let me give you an example of a modern day covenant. When you go to a wedding, then the bride and the groom, they make their vows and they make commitments to each other that are for life. Before the congregation, before God, they promise to be faithful, they promise to love one another and all the other things that are part of the marriage ceremony. That is a covenant, people making an agreement, committing themselves to one another. And in a covenant, we have commitments and we have reasonable expectations of the parties to the covenant. And the covenants in the Bible are just that. They're commitments made by God to his people with a corresponding commitment by the people to God. One difference from any other covenants is that the covenant isn't negotiated. It's not something that uh, both parties discuss and agree to. God sets the terms of the covenant because he is the great creator, but they are fair and they demonstrate his love and concern for us. Now, when we come to the Old Testament, and particularly the prophets of the Old Testament, including Malachi, the prophets are covenant enforcers. They are largely there to remind the people of the covenant that God has made with them and their responsibilities under it. And that's very much the case in the book of Malachi. You can see Malachi uh, as being based around six disputes. Six disputes between God and the Jewish nation. And in both of them, all of them, God says something and the people respond in some kind of way, and then God explains why generally the people are wrong. So the first dispute, the people say, well, how does God love us? We're not doing very well physically. Has God broken his part of the covenant? And God says, no, I've not broken my covenant. I still love you. And then he goes on to make it clear that the covenant has actually been broken by the people that they've despised God, that they've not followed God in the way they should, that they've given substandard sacrifices, given the worst of their animals rather than the best, that they've been unfaithful, unfaithful in marriage, but also unfaithful to God. And in our passage today, God says, you've robbed me. Strong language, isn't it? God says, you have robbed me. So we're going to think about what that means, and we're going to think about what it means for us. And I think this is very relevant for us, because if we think about what's happening here, we have a people who think that they're okay with God. This is not like it was in the time of Elijah, when you had a king, Ahab, who was totally opposed to God and everything he stood for. Not even like the time of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah preached God's word, and because of that, he was thrown into prison and put in a pit. In these circumstances, the nation was in many ways opposed to God, and they were judged for it. But in this situation we're looking at today, the people were saying, we are God's people, we follow God, we live for God, and they're thinking God's not doing his part of the bargain, And God's saying, no, actually what's happened is that you're not keeping your part of the covenant. You're not doing what you committed to do. So let's say we'll go through the passage first and try and work out what it means in its original context for the, the people of God. And then we'll go back through it again and we'll learn some lessons for today. So three headings as we think about the original meaning, an unceasing covenant, an uncomfortable claim, and an unchanged commitment. So we're starting at verses 6 and the beginning of verse 7. And God says, you need to return to me. That's in verse 7, verse, verse, part of verse 7. Return to me and I will return to you. Now, for people to return to God, they must have gone away from God, mustn't they? 
they can't have been living the way that God expected them to do. And having broken the covenant, you might think, well, God could have rejected his people. God would have said, right, that's it. The covenant's been broken. I'm having no more to do with you. But God says, no, I'm not like that. I don't change. You may have broken the covenant, but I am still adhering to the covenant if you meet the conditions attached to it. I'm not just a God who demands of you, and if you don't do what I say, I'll destroy you. Rather, I'm a God who is merciful and who understands your weaknesses and has mercy on you in not destroying you. But I'm a God of justice. And the law demands that you do the things that I have said. And if you don't do it, the law says you will lose out on my blessing. So in this case, the crops weren't yielding what the people expected them to. They were going through a period when physically things were quite hard for them. And God says, I could have destroyed you. I could have said I want no more to do with you. But my covenant is still intact. Return to me and I will return to you. I am a merciful God, and his covenant hadn't stopped. He then makes what I've called an uncomfortable claim. So the people come back and say, well, we ha- how can we return? We've never left you. Why are we to return? And God says, you rob me. You have taken things that are mine and have treated them as if they were yours. The people say, well, how is that? How have we robbed you? And God says, you haven't given what you were due to give under the covenant. You haven't given the tithes and offerings that were due to me. Let's just take a minute to think about tithes. Um, It's a concept that will be familiar to many people, but perhaps not to everyone. So tithing is giving to God. Why do we do it? Why should the Israelites do it? Because everything we have comes from God. Nothing that is ours is because of us or because we are wonderful. It is because God has so graciously provided this wonderful world we live in uh, and everything in it. It all belongs to him and we are simply giving back something that comes from God giving it, in this case, to some extent out of duty because the the covenant said that the Israelites would give a tithe, a tenth of everything they had, but also giving out of love and thanksgiving, recognising that our great God is so generous to us and has given us so bountifully. So a tithe is a recognition of all that we we have comes from God. God. And in the Old Testament context, uh, as the Israelites gave their tithe, what it was was a tenth of all their crops, their fruit, and their livestock. Ten percent of everything that they made, everything that came to them, was to be given to God. They could give on top of that. They could give additional offerings to show their love for God and for all that he had done for them. But ten percent, one-tenth, was the minimum. And it wasn't just to show their obedience and their love to God. It had a specific purpose as well. The tithe went towards God's work, God's workers, the Levites Levites and the priests, and the poor. And there are various rules about how it was divided up and how it was to be given. But it was for God's work, for those who served God uh, full time, and it was for those who were going through times of particular need. And if people gave generously, if they gave their tithe and did it willingly and maybe on top of that, then says God, I will bless you. And the outcome of being obedient to God was that the people experienced his blessing in their lives. And at that time, it was largely talking about a physical blessing. The nation was at peace, didn't have other nations round about trying to take it. Or or it was that they had good crops that, that God prospered them. 
And God says, you've been robbing me by not giving your tithe. Now, notice it was what he says. He says, give all your tithe. So it wasn't that the Israelites had said, we're not giving God anything. We're going to keep it all for ourselves. They were making a bit of an effort, but not enough. They were thinking, a bit is enough for God. Doesn't really matter if it's not the full amount that he's asked for. And God says, no, the covenant says, give your 10%, give your tithe. That is what I expect from you. And then finally, as we look quickly through this section, there is an unchanged commitment. And that in verses 10 to 12. Throughout the Old Testament, God has said, if my people honour me, then I will honour them and they will know my blessing. And he says the same thing here in quite colourful language. He says, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be enough room to store it. Now, I think when he talks about opening the floodgates of heaven, he is talking particularly about the rains coming. Now, perhaps the rains had been withheld because of the disobedience of the people. God will provide enough rain and more so that they can get the best possible crop from their land. And alongside it, he says, I'll also stop the pest devouring your crops, the, the locusts and the others that would come in and, and would take the, the valuable crops from the people. And I'll make sure the grapes don't fall from the vine before they're ripe. In other words, God says, if you honour me, if you give me what is due to me, you won't lose out because I will bless you abundantly. I wonder if in the background here, the people are saying, well, we've not got very much at the moment. We're not very well off because our crops haven't been particularly good. So we're going to have to cut back on the amount that we give to God. We're going to have to give less than 10% because we're not feeling very well off and it's going to hurt us if we give more. And God is then saying to him, no, you've got it the wrong way around. You don't expect me to bless you and then you will get the blessing. And then you can give to me rather. Don't expect me to bless you and then you give to me. Rather, you do your part and I will then bless you. So that, broadly speaking, is what the passage says. And then at the end, there's this wonderful thing that the Lord says is not just going to be for you. All the nations round about will see what a delightful land you have. In other words, as God's people obey him, as God blesses them, then the people around look on enviously and say, this nation which God has blessed, how can we get that blessing? Why is God so wonderfully uh, doing this to them? They will be called blessed. So how does that apply to us? A lot of Old Testament passages we can't just take and, and say here's what happened then, exactly the same thing must apply to us, let's just move it over and put a Christian context to it. We have to look at passages in the context in which they were written and in the circumstances of the time. So let's go back through the passage and let's think how it might apply to us. And I've got three G's for this section, the same verses, grace, generosity, and gain. So to begin with, as I said at the start, we're talking about a covenant here. God's covenant with the Israelites under which if they were obedient to him, he would bless them. It was a covenant based on God's law and on what the people did as they saw and sought to obey God's law. Be obedient to God, and he will bless you. Now, we said at the beginning, there is a new covenant, a different covenant that has been given to us under Jesus. And the basis of this new covenant is not that we do lots of things, that we obey God's law, and then he blesses us for it. Rather, the new covenant is based on God's grace or on God's undeserved favour on it. And the basis for the new covenant is that God blesses us. And then in response to that, out of thanksgiving to that, we are obedient to what he calls us to do. Do you get the difference? On the one hand, you've got, you do this and you'll get the blessing. 
On the other hand, you've got the blessing. Now it's your responsibility to be obedient to it. The one co covenant based on the law, the other covenant based on God's grace. But they do have some things in common. We talked about God's justice and God's mercy. God's justice in that if the people didn't obey him, didn't keep the law, then they would lose out. The, the, the conditions of the law would come into play. God's mercy that the people weren't destroyed even though they hadn't obeyed his law. And the new covenant is also based on God's justice and God's mercy. God's justice that says if you sin, then there are consequences of that. That the person who sins deserves God's divine wrath, God's punishment for what they've done. But there is justice in the new covenant because Jesus took that punishment. The punishment that was due to us, Jesus went to the cross and took on himself so that if we trust in him, then through the grace of God, we are forgiven for all the wrong we've done. We are restored to a relationship with the almighty God of heaven. It's not that the old covenant was about justice and the new covenant isn't. God's justice hasn't changed, God hasn't changed, but in his grace, he, he has satisfied his justice by his son, the Lord Jesus, taking the penalty. So by grace, we are saved through faith in the Lord Jesus. And we still have that mercy of God, but so wonderfully displayed through Jesus. So much uh, clearer to us what a merciful God we have, that we who deserve nothing, we who had nothing, we who should have been punished for all the wrong we've done. God, if we trust in Jesus, has wiped that out and we have experienced his mercy. If we know the Lord Jesus, we should be rejoicing in that today. But as we rejoice, as we come with thankful hearts before God, then we want to be obedient to him as well. Not so that we'll gain from it in any material sense, but because we love the Lord Jesus, we love everything that he has done for us. Under the old covenant, the law was summed up um, by love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Well, that hasn't changed. But actually, we could really simplify things and say under the new covenant... What is expected of us is that we be like Jesus. That we look at the Lord Jesus and what he was, all that he did, all, all the love and care he showed for others. And that is our example. And if we can be like Jesus, then yes, we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and our neighbour as ourselves. But we'll do it out of gratitude and out of love for him. We have experienced God's grace if we have trusted in him. And therefore, we should be, have a real desire to obey him and to live for him. But let's move on. And the following verses were about giving, about the tithe that the Israelites had to give to God. And the question then arises, should we be tithing today? How should we give to God? How much? should we give to God? I'm not here to guilt trip anyone into giving to the church or to anyone anything else, but I do want us this morning to take very seriously our finances and our responsibilities with them. I'm sure there are some people here who give very sacrificially to God. Might be to the church, might be to other Christian work, might be to the relief of those in need, the relief of poverty uh, and those who have particular needs. There are some who give what they can afford and more for that uh, and make great sacrifices so that they can demonstrate their love for God and show it to others. I suspect for a lot of us, we give, we give maybe a reasonable amount, but it doesn't hurt us that much. We give what we can afford and we do it for God's work, um, but it's not really making us feel any worse off 
immaterially. And perhaps there are some people who don't give at all, maybe haven't even thought uh, about giving. So what does the Bible say to us about how we should give? Now, there are two views on tithing. One is that the pattern was set by God in the Old Testament. You give a tenth, that is the core of your giving, and Christians shouldn't work to a lower standard than that. Christians should give a tenth of everything they make to God's work. The second view is that everything I have belongs to God. I don't want to get caught up in legalistic things. I will give as God enables me, as God puts it on my heart. Now, both of them have good points. Systematically giving a tenth means we are giving a good amount to God's worth. Giving when God lays it in our heart is also good that, that we're not giving mindlessly, that we're giving as God prompts us to. The danger with tithing is that we could come up with an attitude that says, well, a tenth of what I get is God's and the rest is mine. And I've done my duty to God and that's it. I can do what I like with the rest of it. The danger of not tithing is perhaps we give quite a lot less than 10%. If only when we feel called to give, we give money, then there's a good chance it actually won't be that much. And in particular, if we're having a month when things are maybe feeling a little bit tight, we might say, well, this month I won't give quite as much. I've not really got very much to give. Our giving to God takes lower priority than other things. So good points and bad points with both. Let me focus for a minute on a verse from the New Testament, uh, and we'll try to learn from that and come to a conclusion. So this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, a couple of chapters, chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, well worth reading in the context of thinking about our attitudes towards money. Paul's encouraging the Corinthians to give generously to help Christians who are going through times of poverty. And he says this, each one of you should give just as he decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. Can I suggest that this verse presents three attitudes towards giving to God? The first we could call grudge giving. I'm giving because I feel I'm obliged to. I've been made to feel guilty that I'm not giving. I think I shouldn't really need to, but it's going to cost me. I'm not really wanting to do it. And yes, giving in that way is better than not giving at all, but it's not giving that's going to bring us great joy and great satisfaction in our lives. Second kind of giving you might call duty giving, under compulsion. So this is people who maybe tithe or maybe give a different percentage, but they think, I, I, I need to be systematic in my giving. I, I want to do that, but I'm doing it out of a sense of duty. A bit like the Israelites here were being told, give your tenth, don't give the, the, the lower amount that you're giving. So people are saying, I, I, I know I need to give, and I'll give a certain amount, but I'm doing it out of a sense of duty, uh, and they don't really get any benefit, any blessing from it. Better than giving grudgingly, better than not giving at all, but perhaps not really bringing us the blessing that God would want us to give. And so the third kind of giving I've called thanksgiving. This is giving because God has given to us and we want to give back to him and we want to give towards his work and towards the blessing of others. It is giving cheerfully and willingly, even when it costs us, because we know it is what God wants us to do, and we want to be obedient to God and to his word. Really great if all our giving came into that thanksgiving category. Now, just as I finish on thinking about giving, come back to this question of tithing. How should we give to God's work? I think, and I'm not forcing this on anyone, I think it's good if we have a, a portion of our giving that comes automatically out of our bank account and in a sense we don't see it and don't miss it. 
So every month we know we're giving a certain amount towards God's work and that is fixed. On top of that, God may well prompt us and put a need before us, whether a Christian need or a need in our world situation. Turkey at the moment would be an example. Being willing to give on top of our regular amounts. And one last thing. For some people, I've said giving 10% would be a major sacrifice, and some people do it, and that's highly commendable. For many of us, 10% probably isn't enough. If God has given us abundantly of what we have, if we have all we could need and more, then we shouldn't be seeing 10% as a cap or as a norm. It may be a useful guideline, but many of us can afford to give much more than that if we want to and if God calls us to, and to do it cheerfully. I'll leave that with you to think about. But let's come on to the last couple of verses, and there are differences of views on this as well. If we give to God's work, if we give money to God, should we expect to receive more from God in return? If you listen to many preachers, particularly American preachers, they would suggest if you give to God, you can expect to receive much greater material blessings back. Something that's called the health and wealth gospel. Is that what we should expect from God? Well, let's go back to what we said earlier about the covenants. Under the old covenant, you gave to God and God blessed you. And that is what the writer in Malachi is talking about here. God is saying that my covenant is, if you're obedient to me, I will honour that and you will be blessed through it. Under the new covenant, the blessing comes first to us. We have been blessed by God with the salvation through the Lord Jesus and everything else that we have. And as a consequence of that, we should have a real desire to give to him, to give our time, our gifts and our money and not to expect a lot in return. We will be blessed by giving. We will be blessed by the knowledge that we are obeying God, that we are joyfully serving him, that we are helping others and helping God's work through what we give. We will know also that we're building up treasure in heaven. If we honour God in this world, he will honour us in the next. But we shouldn't be doing it so that we will be better off materially. Indeed, if we're giving sacrificially, we should expect to be worse off materially, but much better spiritually. Let me end this section with a quote from C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, says this, I don't believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as us, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities, and I would increase Christian given, do not at all pinch or hamper us, I would say they're too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. I leave the takeaway and think about you may or may not agree with it, but these were the words of C.S. Lewis. Now let's try and get away directly from giving and let's uh, pull things together uh, as we finish this morning. There was a, a company called F Secure who ran an experiment a few years ago. They're an online security company. They went to Canary Wharf in London. Canary Wharf, many people will know, is a big uh, complex of businesses, high-rise uh, towers and so on. They went to Canary Wharf uh, and they set up in a cafe and they got out a Raspberry Pi microcomputer and a, a wireless aerial. Connected the two together with elastic bands, apparently, and set up a Wi-Fi hotspot. Now, most people are familiar with the Wi-Fi hotspot. If you go somewhere where you've not got Wi-Fi, you've got, got a mobile phone reception, you might look on your phone, see is there any Wi-Fi nearby, and if you find something you log on to, then you can do your internet. So this company, they set up this Wi-Fi hotspot just using a Raspberry Pi uh, and a little aerial. 
And as many companies do when they offer us hotspots, they added some terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions, long list as usual, but the terms and conditions included a clause that says, in return for free Wi-Fi, I commit to giving you my firstborn child to do whatever you want to with them for the rest of their lives. And they called that the Herod Clause in the contract. And in a very short time, they had a good number of people who signed up, obviously hadn't read it or, or didn't believe what was said. And we might have some sympathy with them. I think one of the, the times when Christians routinely lie and maybe don't feel guilty about it is when you tick that box that says, I've read all the terms and conditions of this contract, and perhaps we should read them more carefully. But the point of that is, these contracts we could compare to the law in the Old Testament. It's complicated. It, it, it's difficult to understand and difficult to meet completely. Apparently, on average, there are two and a half thousand words in these online contracts. You take about 10 minutes if you read every word. So things are difficult. We literally signed up to them, maybe not realising what they were signing up to. And it was really difficult. It was, in fact, it was impossible to keep the law of God. When it comes to the new covenant, it's very simple. Yes, there are guidelines in the Bible. Yes, we can read what God expects from us, particularly in the, the, the letters of the New Testament and the instructions that are given there. But it's not that there are lots of hidden terms and conditions, and if we don't keep to them, then God will reject us. Rather, under the new covenant, God has accepted us for what we are in all our sin, in all our inadequacy, if we've trusted in him. And that's not going to change. But we have the opportunity, very simply, as I said earlier, to try to be like Jesus, to live the way that Jesus lived, and to become more and more like him. We're not governed by lots of rules. But as I also think said earlier, it's not a lower standard. Being like Jesus is a standard we'll never reach in this world. But we should make every effort because he died for us. We love him. We care about him. We want him to be glorified. And in our lives, whether it's in our giving, or whether it's in our relationships with others, whether it's in our service, or whatever other area, if we truly love the Lord Jesus, if we have truly experienced his grace, what God expects of us is that we seek to be like Jesus and to live lives that are pleasing to him. May that be true of, of all of us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this very powerful passage from Malachi and for the way that, that you very strongly condemned the people because they were half-hearted in their attitude towards you. They were robbing you by not giving what they should have. We pray that you help us not to be half-hearted as we have experienced abundant grace uh, through the Lord Jesus. Help us to be willing to give and to give again of all that we have. Help us to know the joy that comes from being obedient as we seek to follow him. Pray for any who maybe don't know the Lord Jesus this morning, who haven't yet experienced his grace. We thank you that Jesus died so that they could be forgiven and we pray that they will come in faith and put their trust in him. We thank you for this time together. We commit ourselves to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to hand back to Fiona and the band. We're going to sing a song, which is a, a, an indication of our commitment to the Lord Jesus. Yeah, let's stand together and sing, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. <laughs>
of our service this morning. Can I just thank you uh, all for being uh, with us? Please don't feel that you need to rush off. Uh, we have tea and coffee over to my right, your left. Uh, as always, if there's anything that you would like to discuss or anything that you'd like prayer for, just please catch me or Ian or anybody else that you've seen up front leading the service this morning, and we'd be delighted to do that with you. Um, let me just finish by reading these verses from Titus, and then we'll close our service for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Amen.